Hello, and welcome back to Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner, where I read plays, poems, or whatever's currently striking my fancy at the moment. Today we're going to be finishing out my small little collection of the Brothers Chapek with R.U.R., otherwise known as Rossum's Universal Robots, a play in three acts and an epilogue by Carl Chapek, translated from the Czech by P. Selver and adapted for the English stage by Nigel Playfair. For acting purposes, it was found necessary to make a few alterations not included in this version. Chief of these was the removal from the list of characters of two names, Fabri and Hellman. R.U.R. was first produced by Mr. Basil Dean for the Reen Dean Company at the St. Martin Theatre in April 1923. The characters are Harry Domain, General Manager for Rossum's Universal Robots, Fabri, Chief Engineer for R.U.R., Dr. Gall, Head of the Physiological Department of R.U.R., Dr. Hellman, Psychologist-in-Chief, Jacob Berman, Managing Director of RUR, Alquist, Clerk of the Works, RUR, and Helena Glory, Daughter of Professor Glory of Oxbridge University. There's also Emma, her maid, Marius, a robot, Sulla, a robotess, Radius, a robot, Primus, a robot, and Helena, a robotess, a robot servant, and numerous robots. On a remote island. Act 1. Central office of the factory of Rossum's Universal Robots. Entrance at the back on the right. The windows look out onto the endless rows of factory buildings. Domain is sitting in a revolving chair at a large knee-hole writing table on which stand an electric lamp, telephone, letterweight, correspondence file, etc. On the left-hand wall hang large maps showing steamships and railway routes, a large calendar and a clock indicating a few minutes before noon. On the right-hand wall are fastened printed placards. Cheap labor, Rossum's robots. Robots for the tropics, $150 each. Everyone should buy his own robot. Do you want to cheapen your output? Order Rossum's robots. More maps, shipping, transport, arrangements, etc. A tape machine showing rates of exchange stands in one corner. In contrast to these wall fittings, the floor is covered with a splendid turkey carpet. On the right stand a round table, a sofa, leather armchair, and a bookshelf containing bottles of wine and spirits instead of books. Cashier's desk on the left. Next to Domain's table, Sulla is typing letters. Domain, dictating. We do not accept any liability for goods damaged in transit. When the consignment was shipped, we drew your captain's attention to the fact that the vessel was unsuitable for the transport of robots. The matter is one of your own insurance company. We beg to remain for Rossum's Universal Robots. Finished? Sulla. Yes. Domain. Another letter. To the E.B. Hudson Agency. New York. Date. We beg to acknowledge receipt of order for 5,000 robots. As you are sending your own vessel, please dispatch as cargo bouquets for RUR, the same to be credited as part payment of the amount due to us. We beg to remain... Finished? Sulla, typing the last word. Yes. Domain. Fredericksburg, Hamburg. Date. We beg to acknowledge receipt of order for 15,000 robots. The house telephone rings. Domain picks it up and speaks into it. Hello? This is the central office. Yes, certainly. Oh, yes, as usual. Of course, send them a cable. Good. Hangs up the telephone. Where did I leave off? Sulla, we beg to acknowledge receipt of order for 15,000 R. Domain. 15,000 R. 15,000 R. Marius, entering. There is a lady, sir, asking to, who is she? I don't know, sir. She gave me this card. Domain reads, Professor William Glory, St. Tridesswood's Oxbridge. Ask her to come in. Marius, opening the door. Please step this way, ma'am. Enter Helena Glory. Exit Marius. Domain, standing up. What can I do for you, madam? Helena. You are Mr. Domain, the general manager. I am. I have come to you with Professor Glory's card. That is sufficient. Professor Glory is my father. I am Helena Glory. Miss Glory, it is an unusual honor for us to be... to be... yes, well... to be allowed to welcome the distinguished professor's daughter. Please sit down. Sulla, you may go. Exit Sulla. Sitting down. How can I be of service to you, Miss Glory? I have come here to have a look at our factory where people are made, like all visitors. Well, there is no objection. I... I I thought it was forbidden. It is forbidden to enter the factory, of course, but everybody comes here with an introduction, and then... 
and you show everybody? Only certain things. The manufacture of artificial people is a secret process. If you only knew how enormously that interests me, you were going to say, Europe's talking about nothing else. Why don't you let me finish speaking? I beg your pardon. Did you want to say anything else? I only wanted to ask whether or not I can make a special exception in your case and show you our factory. Certainly, Miss Glory. How do you know that I wanted to ask you that? They all do. Standing up. We shall consider it a special honor to show you more than the rest, because... Indeed, I, I mean... Thank you. But you must undertake not to divulge the least Helena, standing up and giving him her hand. My word of honor. Thank you. Won't you raise your veil? Oh, of course, you want to see me. I beg your pardon. Would you mind letting go of my hand? Domain, releasing it. I beg your pardon. Helena, taking off her veil. You want to see whether I am a spy or not? How cautious you are. Domain, looking at her intently. Hm. Of course, we... That is, you don't trust me? Oh, indeed, Miss Glory. I'm only too delighted. Weren't you lonely on the voyage? Why? Because, I mean to say, you're so young. Yes. Shall we go straight into the factory? Twenty-two, I think, eh? Twenty-two what? Years. Twenty-one. Why do you want to know? Because as... You'll make a long stay, won't you? That depends on how much of the factory you show me. Oh, hang the factory. But you shall see everything, Miss Glory. Indeed you shall. Please, sit down. Would you like to hear the story of the invention? Helena. Yes, please. Sits down. Well, then. Sits down on the writing table, looking at Helena with rapture, and reels off rapidly. It was in the year 1922 that old Rossum, the great physiologist, who was then quite a young scientist, betook himself to this distant island for the purpose of studying the ocean fauna. Full stop. On this occasion, he attempted by chemical synthesis to imitate the living matter known as protoplasm, until he suddenly discovered a substance which behaved exactly like living matter, although its chemical composition was different. That was in the year 1932, exactly 400 years after the discovery of America. Woo! Do you know that by heart? Yes. Physiology, Miss Glory, is not my line. Shall I go on? Please do. And then, Miss Glory... Old Rossum wrote the following in his day book. Nature has found only one method of organizing living matter. There is, however, another method more simple, flexible, and rapid, which has not yet occurred to nature at all. This second process by which life can be developed was discovered by me today. Imagine him, Miss Glory, writing those wonderful words. Imagine him sitting over a test tube and thinking how the whole tree of life would grow from it, how all animals would proceed from it, beginning with some sort of beetle and ending with man himself, a man of different substance from ours. Miss Glory, that was a tremendous moment. Go on, please. Now the thing was, how to get the life out of the test tube and hasten development, to form organs, bones, and nerves, and so on, to find such substances as catalytics, enzymes, hormones, and so forth. In short... You understand? I don't know. <laughs> Not much, I'm afraid. Never mind. You see, with the help of his tinctures, he could make whatever he wanted. He could have produced a Medusa with the brain of a Socrates, or a worm fifty yards long. But being without a grain of humor, he took it into his head to make a normal vertebrate. This artificial living matter of his had a raging thirst for life. It didn't mind being sewn up or mixed together. That, you'll admit, couldn't be done with a natural albumen. And that's how he set about it. About what? About imitating nature. First of all, he tried making an artificial dog. That took him several years and resulted in a sort of stunted calf which died in a few days. I'll show you it in the museum. And then old Rossum started on the manufacture of man. And I must divulge this to nobody? To nobody in the world. <laughs> it's a pity that it can already be found in every school lesson book. Yes. Domain jumps up from the table and sits down besides Helena. But do you know what isn't in the lesson books? Taps his forehead. That old Rossum was quite mad. Seriously, Miss Glory, you must keep this to yourself. The old crank actually wanted to make people. But you do make people. Synthetically, Miss Helena. But old Rossum meant it actually. He wanted to become a sort of scientific substitute for God, you know. He was a fearful materialist, and that's why he did it all. His sole purpose was nothing more or less than a supply proof that providence was no longer necessary. So he took it into his head to make people exactly like us. Do you know anything about anatomy? Only a very little. So do I. Imagine then that he decided to manufacture everything as in the human body. 
I'll show you in the museum the bungling attempt it took him ten years to produce. It was to have been a man, but it lived for three days only. Then up came young Rossum, an engineer, the nephew of old Rossum. A wonderful fellow, Miss Glory. When he saw what a mess of it the old man was making, he said, It's absurd to spend ten years making a man. If you can't make him quicker than nature, you may as well shut up shop. Then he set about learning anatomy himself. There's nothing about that in the lesson books. Domain standing up. The lesson books are full of paid advertisement and rubbish at that. For example, it says that the robots were invented by an old man, but it was young Rossum who had the idea of making living and intelligent working machines. What the lesson books say about the united efforts of the two great Rossums is all a fairy tale. They used to have dreadful rows. The old atheist hadn't the slightest conception of industrial matters, and the end of it was that young Rossum shut him up in some laboratory or other and let him fritter the time away with his monstrosities, while he himself started on the business from an engineer's point of view. Old Rossum cursed him, and before he died he managed to botch up two physiological horrors. Then one day they found him dead in the laboratory. That's the whole story. And what about the young man? Well, anyone who's looking into anatomy will have seen at once that man is too complicated and that a good engineer can make him more simply. So young Rossum began to overhaul anatomy and tried to see what could be left out or simplified. In short, but this isn't boring you, Miss Glory. No, on the contrary, it's awfully interesting. So young Rossum said to himself, a man is something that, for instance, feels happy, plays the fiddle, likes to go on walks, and in fact wants to do a whole lot of things that are really unnecessary. Oh, wait a bit that are unnecessary when he's wanted, let us say, to weave or to count. Do you play the fiddle? No. That's a pity. But a working machine must not want to play the fiddle, must not feel happy, must not do a whole lot of other things. A petrol motor must not have tassels or ornaments, Miss Glory. And to manufacture artificial workers is the same as to manufacture motors. The process must be of the simplest and the product of the best from a practical point of view. What sort of worker do you think is the best from a practical point of view? The best? Perhaps the one who's most honest and hard-working. No. The cheapest. The one whose needs are the smallest. Young Rossum invented a worker with the minimum amount of requirements. He had to simplify him. He rejected everything that did not contribute directly to the progress of work. In this way, he rejected everything that makes man more expensive. In fact, he had rejected man and made the robot. My dear Miss Gloria, the robots are not people. Mechanically, they are more perfect than we are. They have an enormously developed intelligence, but they have no soul. Have you ever seen what a robot looks like inside? Good gracious, no. Very neat. Very simple. Really a beautiful piece of work. Not much in it, but everything in flawless order. The product of an engineer is technically at a higher pitch of perfection than a product of nature. Man is supposed to be a product of nature. So much the worse. Nature hasn't the least notion of modern engineering. Would you believe that young Rossum played at being nature? What do you mean? He began to manufacture super robots, regular giants. He tried to make them four yards high, but they were a frost. A frost? Yes. For no reason at all, their limbs used to keep snapping off. Evidently, our planet is too small for giants. (laughs) Now we only make robots of normal size and of very high-class human finish. I saw the first robots at home. The town council bought them. I I mean, engaged them for work. Bought them, dear Miss Glory. Robots are bought and sold. These were employed as sweepers. I saw them sweeping. They're so strange and quiet. Did you see my typist? I didn't notice her particularly. Domain. Rings. You see, Rossum's Universal Robots Factory didn't produce a uniform brand of robots. We have robots of finer and coarser grades. The best will live about twenty years. Then they perish? Yes. They get used up. Enter Sulla. Domain. Sulla, let Miss Glory look at you. Helena, standing up and holding out her hand. So glad to meet you. You must feel terribly dull in this out-of-the-way spot, don't you? Sulla. I don't know, Miss Glory. Please sit down. Helena, sitting down. Where do you come from? Sulla. From there. From the factory. Ah, you were born there. Yes, I was made there. Helena, jumping up. What? Domain. (laughs) Sulla is a robot. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Domain, laying his hand on Sulla's shoulder. Sulla isn't angry. See, Miss Gloria, the kind of skin we make? Feel her face. Helena. Oh, no, no. You wouldn't know that she's of different material from us. Turn round, Sulla. Helena. Stop, stop. Talk to Miss Gloria, Sulla. She's an important visitor. Sulla. Please sit down. Both sit down. 
Did you have a pleasant crossing? Helena. Oh, yes, certainly. Don't go back on the Amelia, Miss Glory. The barometer is falling steadily. Wait for the Pennsylvania. That's a very good, powerful vessel. What's its speed? Twenty knots an hour. Twelve thousand tons. One of the latest vessels, Miss Glory. Helena. Th thank you. Sulla. A crew of eighty. Captain Harpy. Eight boilers. Domain. <laughs> That's enough, Sulla. Now show your knowledge in French. You know French? I know four languages. I can write, Dear Sir, Monsieur, Gerreter Herr, E. Mr. Seigneur. Helena, jumping up. What nonsense! Sulla isn't a robot. Sulla is a girl like me. Sulla, it's naughty of you. Why do you take part in such a hoax? I am a robot. No, no, you're not telling the truth. Oh, Sulla, forgive me, I know. They forced you to do it for an advertisement. Sulla, you are a girl like me, aren't you? Tell me now. I'm sorry, Miss Glory. Sulla is a robot. You're not telling the truth. Domain starting up. What? Excuse me, Miss Glory, then I must convince you. Enter Marius. Domain. Marius, take Sulla into the testing room for them to open her. Quickly. Helena. Where? Into the testing room. When they've cut her up, you can go and have a look. I shan't go. Excuse me, you spoke of lies. You wouldn't have her killed. You can't kill machines. Helena, embracing Sulla. Don't be afraid, Sulla. I won't let you go. Tell me, darling, are they always so cruel to you? You mustn't put up with that, Sulla. You mustn't. I am a robot. That doesn't matter. Robots are just as good as we are. So that you wouldn't let yourself be cut into pieces. Yes. You're not afraid of death, then? I cannot tell, Miss Glory. Do you know what would happen to you there? Yes, I would cease to move. How dreadful. Marius, tell Miss Glory what you are. Marius, the robot. Would you take Sulla into the testing room? Yes. Would you be sorry for her? I cannot tell. What would happen to her? She would cease to move. They would put her into the stamping mill. That is death, Marius. Aren't you afraid of death? No. You see, Miss Glory, the robots are not at all attached to life. They have no reason to be. They have no enjoyments. They are less than so much grass. Oh, stop. Send them away. Marius, Sulla, you may go. Exit Sulla and Marius. How terrible. It's scandalous. Why scandalous? It is. Of course it is. Why did you call her Sulla? Isn't it a nice name? It's a man's name. Sulla was a Roman general. Oh, we thought that Marius and Sulla were lovers. No, Marius and Sulla were generals, and fought against each other in the year... I've forgotten now. Come here to the window. What do you see? Bricklayers. They are robots. All our work people are robots. And down there, can you see anything? Some sort of office. A counting house. And in it... Clerks. A lot of clerks. They are robots. All our clerks are robots. When you see the factory, sound of factory whistles and sirens. Mm. Midday. The robots don't know when to stop work. In two hours, I'll show you the kneading trough. What kneading trough? The pestles and mortar, as it were, for beating up the paste. In each one, we mix the ingredients for a thousand robots at one operation. Then, there are the vats for the preparation of liver, brains, and so on. Then you'll see the bone factory. After that, I'll show you this spinning mill. What spinning mill? For weaving nerves and veins. Miles and miles of digestive tubes pass through it at a stretch. Then there's the fitting shed, where all the parts are put together like motor cars. Next come the drying kiln and the warehouse in which the new products work. Good gracious, do they have to work immediately? Well, you see, they work like any new appliance. They get used to existence. They sort of grow firm inside. We have to make a slight allowance for natural development. In the meantime, they undergo training. How is that done? It's much the same as going to school. They learn to speak, write, and count. They have astonishing memories, you know. If you were to read a 20-volume encyclopedia to them, they'd repeat it back to you with absolute accuracy. But they never think of anything new. Then they're sorted out and distributed. 15,000 daily, not counting a regular percentage of defective specimens that are thrown into the stamping mill. And so on, and so on. Oh, let's talk about something else. There's only a handful of us among a hundred thousand robots and not one woman. We talk about nothing but the factory all day, every day. It's just as if we're under a curse, Miss Glory. I'm so sorry I said that, that you weren't speaking the truth. A knock at the door. Come in, boys. From the left, enter Mr. Fabri, Dr. Gall, Dr. Hellman, and Alquist. 
Dr. Gall, I beg your pardon. I hope we're not in the way. Come along in. Miss Glory, here are Mr. Alquist, Mr. Fabri, Dr. Gall, and Dr. Hellman. This is Professor Glory's daughter. How do you do? Fabri, we had no idea. Dr. Gall, very honored, I'm sure. Hellman, welcome, Miss Glory. Berman, rushes in from the right. Hello. What's up? Domain, come in, Berman. This is Mr. Berman, Miss Glory. This is the daughter of Professor Glory. Helena, very glad to meet you. Berman, by Jove, that's splendid. Miss Glory, may we send a cablegram to the papers about your... No, no, please don't. Domain, sit down, please, Miss Glory. Berman, allow me, Dr. Gall, dragging up the armchairs. Please, Fabri, excuse me, Alquist, what sort of crossing did you have? Dr. Gall, are you going to stay here long? Fabri, what do you think of the factory, Miss Glory? Hellman, did you come over on the Amelia? Domain, be quiet. Let Miss Glory speak. Helena to Domain. What am I to speak to them about? Domain, about what you like. Helena, shall... May I speak quite frankly? Why, of course. Helena, wavering, then with desperate resolution. Tell me. Doesn't it ever distress you to be treated like this? Fabri, treated? Who by? Helena, everybody. All look at each other in consternation. Alquist, treated? Dr. Gall, what makes you think that? Hellman, treated? Berman, really? Helena, don't you feel that you might be living a better life? Dr. Gall, well, that depends on what you mean, Miss Glory. Helena, I mean that... (sighs) That is perfectly outrageous. It's terrible. Standing up. The whole of Europe is talking about how you're being treated. That's why I came here to see, and it's a thousand times worse than I could have imagined. How can you put up with it? Alquist. Put up with what? Helena. Your position here. Good heavens, you are living creatures just like us, like the whole of Europe, like the whole world. It's scandalous. Disgraceful. Berman. Good gracious, Miss Glory. Fabri. Well, boys, she's not so far out. We live here just like Red Indians. Helena. Worse than Red Indians. May or may I call you brothers? Berman. Of course you may. Why not? Helena. Brothers, I have not come here as my father's daughter. I have come on behalf of the Humanity League. Brothers, the Humanity League now has over 200,000 members. 200,000 people are on your side and offering you their help. Berman. 200,000 people? That's quite a tidy lot, Miss Glory. Quite good. Fabri. I'm always telling you there's nothing like good old Europe. You see, they've not forgotten us. They're offering us help. Dr. Gall. What help? A theater? Hellman. An orchestra? Helena. More than that. Alquist. Just you? Helena. Oh, never mind about me. I'll stay as long as is necessary. Berman. By Jove, that's good. Alquist. Domain, I'm going to get the best room ready for Miss Glory. Domain. Wait a minute. I'm afraid that... that Miss Glory hasn't finished speaking. Helena. No, I haven't. Unless you close my lips by force. Dr. Gall. Harry, don't you dare. Helena. Thank you. I knew that you'd protect me. Domain. Excuse me, Miss Glory, but I suppose you think you're talking to robots. Helena. Startled. Of course. (laughs) I'm sorry. These men are human beings just like us. Like all of Europe. You're not robots? Berman. (laughs) God forbid. Hellman. Puh! Robots indeed. Dr. Gall. No thanks. Helena. But, Fabri, upon my honor, Miss Glory, we aren't robots. Helena. To Domain. Then why did you tell me that all your assistants were robots? Domain. Yes, the clerks. But not the managers. Allow me, Miss Glory. This is Fabri, Chief Engineer for Rossum's Universal Robots. Dr. Gall, Head of the Physiological Department. Dr. Hellman, Psychologist and Chief for the Training of Robots. Jacob Berman, General Business Manager and Alquist Clerk of the Works to Rossum's Universal Robots. Helena. Forgive me, gentlemen, for... for... Have I done something dreadful? Alquist. Not at all, not at all, Miss Glory. Please, sit down. Helena, sitting down. I'm a stupid girl. Send me back by the first ship. Dr. Gull. Not for anything in the world, Miss Glory. Why should we send you back? Helena. Because, you know, because... Because I should disturb your robots for you. Domain. My dear Miss Glory, we've had close upon a hundred preachers and prophets here. Every ship brings us some. Missionaries, anarchists, Salvation Army, all sorts. It's astonishing what a number of religious sects and... Forgive me, I don't mean you. And idiots there are in the world. And you let them speak to the robots? Why not? So far we've let them all do so. The robots remember everything, but that's all. They don't quite even laugh at what people say. 
Really, it's quite incredible. If it would amuse you, Miss Glory, I'll take you over the robot warehouse. It holds about 300,000 of them. Berman, 347,000. Domain. Good. You can say whatever you like to them. You can read the Bible, recite logarithms, whatever you please. You can even preach to them about human rights. Helena. Oh, I think that if you were to show them a little love, Fabri, impossible, Miss Glory. Nothing is more unlike a man than a robot. Helena. What do you make them for, then? Berman. <laughs> That's good. What are robots made for? Fabri. For work, Miss Glory. One robot can replace two and a half workmen. The human machine, Miss Glory, was terribly imperfect. It had to be removed sooner or later. Berman. It was too expensive. Fabri. It was not very effective. It no longer answered the requirements of modern engineering. Nature has no idea of keeping pace with modern labor. From a technical point of view, the whole of childhood is a sheer stupidity. So much time lost. And then again, Helena. Oh, please leave off. Fabri. Pardon me. But kindly tell me what is the real aim of your league, the Humanity League. Helena. Its real purpose is to to protect the robots. And and ensure good treatment for them. Fabri. Not a bad object either. As a machine has to be treated properly. Upon my soul, I approve that. I don't like damaged articles. Please, Miss Glory, enroll us all as contributing as regular as foundation members of your league. Helena. No, you don't understand me. What we really want is to... to liberate the robots. Hellman. How do you propose to do that? Helena. They ought to be... to be dealt with like human beings. Hellman. I suppose they're to vote? To drink beer to order us about? Helena. Why shouldn't they vote? Hellman. Perhaps they're even to receive wages. Helena. Of course they are. Hellman. Fancy that now. And what would they do with their wages, pray? They would buy what they need, what pleases them. That would be very nice, Miss Glory. Only there's nothing that does please the robots. Good heavens, what are they to buy? You can feed them on pineapples, straw, whatever you like. It's all the same to them. They've no appetite at all. They've no interest in anything, Miss Glory. Why, hang it all, nobody's ever yet seen a robot smile. Helena, why don't you make them happier? That wouldn't do, Miss Glory. They are only robots. Helena, oh, but they're so sensible. Helman, not sensible. Acute, confoundly so, but they're nothing else. They've no will of their own, no passion, no soul. Helena, no love, no desire to resist. Rather not. Robots don't love, not even themselves. And the desire to resist... I don't know. Only rarely, only from time to time. Helena. What? Nothing in particular. Occasionally they seem to somehow go off their heads. Something like epilepsy, you know. We call it robot's cramp. They'll suddenly sling down everything they're holding, stand still, gnash their teeth, and then they have to go into the stamping mill. It's evidently some breakdown in the mechanism. Domain. A flaw in the works. It'll have to be removed. Helena. No, no, that's the soul. Fabri. Do you think that the soul first shows itself by a gnashing of teeth? Helena. I don't know. Perhaps it's a sign of revolt. Perhaps it's just a sign that there's a struggle. Oh, if you could infuse them with it. Domain. That'll be remedied, Miss Glory. Dr. Gall is just making some experiments not with regard to that domain. At present I'm making pain nerves, to use a very unscientific expression. Helena. Pain nerves? Dr. Gall. Yes. The robots feel practically no bodily pain. You see, young Rossum provided them with too limited a nervous system. That doesn't answer. We must introduce suffering. Why? Why don't you give them a soul? Why do you want to cause them pain? Dr. Gall. For industrial reasons, Miss Glory. Sometimes a robot does damage to himself because it doesn't hurt him. He puts his hand into the machine, breaks his fingers, smashes his head. It's all the same to him. We must provide them with pain. That's automatic protection against damage. Helena. Will they be happier when they feel pain? Dr. Gall. On the contrary. But they will be more perfect from a technical point of view. Helena. Why don't you create a soul for them? Dr. Gall. That's not in our power. Fabri. That's not in our interest. Berman. That would increase the cost of production. Hang it all, my dear lady. We turn them out at such a cheap rate, 15 pounds each, fully dressed in 15 years ago, they cost 200 pounds. Five years ago, we used to buy clothes for them. Today we have our own weaving mill and now even export cloth five times cheaper than other factories. What do you pay for your yards of cloth, Miss Glory? I don't know. Really, I've forgotten. Good gracious me, and you want to found a humanity league? It only costs a third now, Miss Glory. 
All prices today are a third of what they were. And they'll fall lower still, lower and lower, like that. Eh? I, I don't understand. Why, oh, bless me, Miss Glory, it means that the cost of labor has fallen. A robot food and all costs three and four pence per hour. All factories will go pop like acorns if they don't at once buy robots to lower the cost of production. Yes, and they'll get rid of their workmen. <laughs> of course. But good gracious me. In the meantime, we've dumped 500,000 tropical robots down on the Argentinian pampas to grow corn. Would you mind telling me how much you pay for a loaf of bread? I've no idea. Well, I'll tell you. It now costs two pence in good old Europe, but that's our bread, you know. A loaf of bread for two pence, and the Humanity League knows nothing about it. <laughs> Miss Glory, you don't realize that it's too expensive. But in five years' time, I'll wager that the prices of everything won't be a tenth of what they are now. Why, in five years, we'll be up to our ears in corn and everything else. Alquist. Yes, and all the workers throughout the world will be unemployed. Domain, standing up. They will, Alquist. They will, Miss Glory. But in ten years, Rossum's universal robots will produce so much corn, so much cloth, so much everything that things will practically be without price. Everyone will take as much as he wants. There will be no poverty. Yes, there will be unemployment. But then, there won't be any employment. Everything will be done by living machines. The robots will clothe and feed us. The robots will make bricks and build houses for us. The robots will keep our accounts and sweep our stairs. There will be no employment, but everybody will be free from worry and liberated from the degradation of labor. Everybody will live only to perfect himself. Helena, standing up. Will he? Domain. Of course. It's bound to happen. There may perhaps be terrible doings first, Miss Glory. That simply can't be avoided. But then the servitude of man to man and the enslavement of man to matter will cease. The robots will wash the feet of the beggar and prepare a bed for him in his own house. Nobody will get bread at the price of life and hatred. There will be no artisans, no clerks, no hearers of coal and minders of other men's machines. Alquist. Domain, Domain. What you say sounds too much like paradise. Domain, there was something good in service and something great in humanity. Ah, Harry, there was some kind of virtue in toil and weariness. Domain, perhaps, but we cannot reckon with what is lost when we transform Adam's world. Helena, you have bewildered me. I am a foolish girl. I should like to... I should like to believe this. Dr. Gall, you are younger than we are, Miss Glory. You will live to see it. Hellman, true. I think that Miss Glory might lunch with us. Dr. Gall, of course. Domain, ask on behalf of all of us. Domain, Miss Glory, would you do us the honor? Helena. Thank you so much, but, Fabri, to represent the League of Humanity, Miss Glory, Berman, and in honor of it. Oh. In that case, Fabri, that's right. Miss Glory, excuse me for a few minutes. Dr. Gall, and me, Berman, by Jove, I must send a cable. Hellman, good heavens, I've forgotten. I'll rush out except Domain. Helena, what have they all gone off for? Domain, to cook, Miss Glory. To cook what? Lunch, Miss Glory. Robots do our cooking for us, but but as they've no taste, it's not altogether. That is, Hellman is awfully good at grills, and Gall can make a kind of sauce, and Berman knows all about omelettes. Helena, my goodness, what a banquet. And what's the specialty of Mr... of the clerk of the works? Alquist? <laughs> Nothing. He only lays the table, and Fabri will get together a little fruit. Our cuisine is very modest, Miss Glory. Helena, I wanted to ask you, and I wanted to ask you something, too laying his watch on the table. Five minutes. What do you want to ask? Excuse me, you asked first. Perhaps it's silly of me, but... Why do you manufacture female robots when... When sex means nothing to them? Yes. There's a certain demand for them, you see. Servants, saleswoman's clerk. People are used to it. But... But tell me, are the robots male and female mutually... altogether... altogether indifferent to each other, Miss Glory? There's no sign of any affection between them. Oh, that's terrible. Why? It's so... so unnatural. One doesn't know whether to be disgusted or whether to hate them or perhaps... To pity them? That's more like it. No. Stop. What did you want to ask about? I should like to ask you, Miss Glory, whether or not you will marry me. What? Will you be my wife? No! The idea! Domain, looking at his watch. Another three minutes. If you won't marry me, you'll have to marry one of the other five. But, for heaven's sake, why should I? Because they're all going to ask you in turn. How could they dare do such a thing? 
I'm very sorry, Miss Glory. I think they've fallen in love with you. Please don't let them do it. I'll I'll go away at once. Helena, you wouldn't be so unkind as to refuse them. Helena, but but I can't marry all six. No, but one anyhow. If you don't want me, marry Fabri. I won't. Dr. Gall. No, no, be quiet. I don't want any of you. Another two minutes. This is terrible. I, I think you'd marry any woman who came here. There have been plenty of them, Helena. Young? Yes. And pretty... No, I didn't mean that. Then why didn't you marry any of them? Because I didn't lose my head. Until today. And as soon as you lifted your veil... I know. Another minute. But I don't want to, I tell you. Domain laying both hands on her shoulders. Another minute. Either you must say something fearfully angry to me at point blank, and then I'll leave you alone. Or... Or... You're a rude man. That's nothing. A man has to be a bit rude. That's part of the business. Helena, you're mad. A man has to be a bit mad, Helena. That's the best thing about him. You are... You're... Oh, heavens. What did I tell you? Are you ready? No, no, leave me, please. You're hurting me. The last word, Helena. Perhaps when I know you better. Oh, I don't know. Let me go, please. Knocking at the door. Domain, releasing her. Come in. Enter Berman, Dr. Gall, and Hellman in kitchen aprons. Fabri with a bouquet, Alquist with a napkin under his arm. Domain. Have you finished your job? Berman, solemnly. Yes. So have we. At least I think so. Curtain.